information resources and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance communication resources and faster and more Personal favorite. So, yeah, I'm Nibble. This is uh, tabletop cryptography. Besides Salt Lake, it's Woo! great to be back. And amazing job. I love the venue. Um, you know, the, the group of volunteers that have put this together, you guys have done an amazing, amazing job. Of course, nobody's in here right now because they're all out doing other things. Uh, so uh, very important things, keeping the con running. So I uh, certainly appreciate all their work. Um, so um, really briefly, I am not these guys. Um, everybody knows who those two guys are, right? Uh, yep, Diffie and uh, uh, Schneier. So I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a cryptographer. I am an enthusiast. Uh, so, so some of the things I'm going to say in this uh, talk, while I think are technically accurate, and uh, from my research I've found to be accurate, um, you know, I could be wrong. So, so uh, uh, you know, please keep that in mind. Um, this is who I am, <coughs> uh, Jason Ravieri, aka Nibble, uh, security engineer for CompuNet. Um, you know, really amazing place to work, great group of people, and they see the value in uh, shenanigans like this. Uh, sponsoring B-sides, uh, sponsoring Hacker Camp, uh, you know, being involved in the community. Uh, you can find me at, on Twitter, at Nibble. Oh, did it? Awesome. See, there you go. Um, you know, also, email me. Uh, I'm also a member of DC801, 801 Labs. want to give a shout out to that. A lot of our members here in the, in the <laughs> session today. So, um, you know, it's all about community, right? That's what this, this event's about. Um, that's what... DC 801 is about 801 Labs uh, providing a space to, to, to have that community meet, grow. Uh, so amazing stuff. <clears throat> so why tabletop? So uh, cryptography, um, you know, my day-to-day -day job, I'm dealing with things like IPsec, uh, IPsec if I can say it right, uh, SSL, TLS. Um, privacy has always been an interest of mine. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the history of crypto analysis, uh, uh, the Enigma machine, Alan Turing, uh, and how the, the Enigma, and, and I'll talk on this a little bit later, but, but cracking the Enigma and the technologies that were developed around that kind of um, led directly into what we know as modern computing today. <clears throat> um, I have to definitely give a shout out to Sobit. Stand up, put your hands up. Uh, so, uh, so three years ago, um, the two of us were sitting down. There may have been some adult beverages involved. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, he had this great idea that he wanted to do a hacker camp, uh, uh, essentially a CTF, off the grid, tents, campers, out in the middle of the woods somewhere. And I'm like, you know what, that's a crazy idea, and I love it. Let's do it. What can I do to help? So this guy came up with, with this amazing CTF. We did it up at uh, first year was at Jordan L Reservoir. Uh, last year was up near Strawberry Reservoir on, on BLM land. And it's, it's amazing. It's, you know, we're out in the woods. There's generators to power a full CTF, uh, lock sport, uh, uh, geocaching, just a lot of really fun time just for people that like to get out in the woods a little bit, uh, but still have to get their geek on. Um, so, so one of the things that, that, that I did is I, I said, okay, so I've got this passion for cryptography, cryptoanalysis. I'm not an expert in it, but I'm interested in it. So I learned some more, and one of the big keys there was it had to be off the grid. I wanted something that we could do without our computers, that we could do after hours sitting around the campfire or by generator light or whatever it was, right? Um, so that's kind of how um, the cryptography track came about at at Hacker Camp and that I was, I was uh, uh, helpful with. Um, so this year we're doing Hacker Camp again. Uh, it'll be the third year. It's June 24th through the 25th. Um, uh, and it'll be up at that uh, Strawberry Reservoir site. Uh, uh, it's BLM land, free to camp. Um, you know, come out, check it out. It's really, you know, we had about 30 people up last year. Um, people bring their families. Um, the plan right now is to have a, a kids track. So if you have little ones, you want to get them out in the woods, get them to appreciate nature, but also get them to appreciate hacker culture. That's what it's about. So, Really quick, a couple of uh, terms. Just uh, These are how I interpret these terms, just so we're kind of on the same page. I don't want 
you know, oh, well, you know, cryptography is this. Well, this is what I'm, when I say cryptography in this talk, this is what I mean. Cryptography is basically, uh, you know, the art of writing and solving codes. It comes from the Greek cryptos, meaning hidden, and graphy, meaning writing, right? So, um, ciphertext, um, this is, you know, the, 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 the code after it's been encrypted, right? Uh, so, so uh, you know, a system of words, letters, figures, symbols, whatever, uh, substituted for a normal uh, message for the purpose of secrecy. Uh, cipher is the actual making of the letter-letter substitution, so the process. Um, encryption, again, another word that I'll use for a process of turning text or data into a code or, uh, you know, ciphertext. Uh, cryptology is the study of codes and ciphers. Uh, and cryptoanalysis is the science and of decrypting codes and ciphers. Uh, so, so really, I, I wanted to set the stage kind of uh, with a little bit of history uh, and then dive into the specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, encryption methods that I used at Hacker Camp. Um, and I've got some examples of those, those here. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, we're starting off in ancient times, right? Um, uh, cryptography has been a around for a long time. Uh, 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 probably as long as people have been writing, people have... Uh, had the need to, to uh, maintain some secret or to differentiate their writing in some way. Uh, so the Egyptians uh, used uh, hieroglyphs, as everybody knows. I mean, that's the Rosetta Stone, right? And I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, um, the hieroglyphs um, in, in about um, 1900 BCE, um, they started using hieroglyphic substitution as a way to show um, uh, a... Uh, uh, an enlightened pharaoh, right? And I, I don't remember the pharaoh's name. And I'm really bad at, at pronunciation of Egyptian names anyway. So, um, uh, but uh, what's interesting kind of about the Rosetta Stone is before Rosetta Stone was discovered, we didn't know how to interpret these hieroglyphic symbols. Uh, we kind of had an idea that that was some kind of language, right? But, but what the, the Rosetta Stone allowed was it had three languages on there all with the same text, right? Um, the hieroglyphic text, uh, uh, Demonic, de, demotic text and ancient Greek. Well, we knew what you know how to interpret ancient Greek, so we could extrapolate from that the text in hieroglyphs. So uh, it was kind of a big deal. Um, the uh, in ancient China, uh, um, they were using uh, wax to cover up and and hide their their secrets. Uh, so they would have a, a piece of paper and they would pour wax over it, and the wax would cover. The, the, the text, and then uh, the, the, the recipient would break the wax and, and, and get in there. Um, the ancient Assyrians, uh, between you know, 1500 to 500 BCE, uh, they would use uh, secret tattoos with secret messages. That was a really common thing. Um, uh, the Hebrew scribes, um, around 600 BCE, um, they used a substitution cipher called Atbash. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not you know, uh, a very familiar in Tomic, uh, scholarship, but uh, from my understanding, um, Atbash is almost a literal translation of um, the the word, the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, uh, the Aleph is like A, and the the last uh, character in the Hebrew alphabet. So what what this substitution cipher would do is, you, anytime you had an A, you would put a Z, and anytime you had a B, you would put a Y, etc. Right, um, and and. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Hold on. <laughs> so, so um, what's kind of interesting about that was, I mean, the name of the cipher was w was the the way that it was encrypted, right? So, so um, it's almost kind of conjectured now that it wasn't for secrecy. It was uh, to show that there was some special text here. Um, it was uh, commonly used in the biblical book of Jeremiah. Um, so uh, the other really interesting one is the Kama Sutra, right? So everybody has an idea of what the Kama Sutra is, right? Um, but, um, you know, this is a book that had uh, many techniques that were supposed to be um, uh, what a woman, uh, a mature woman would know, right? And, and one of the really interesting things in there is it had uh, one of the art forms, I didn't just have sex stuff, right? It had, it had other things like book binding and 
perfume making and and carpentry. And one of the things that it had in there was uh, the art of secret writing. Um, so this was a way that a woman could keep her affairs uh, secret. And it was a basic substitution cipher called the, uh, I'm going to slaughter this, but uh, Vatsayana cipher. So uh, a, a, a letter for letter substitution cipher. So uh, pretty interesting. So <clears throat> uh, how, how many of you guys know what a scatale is? Okay, so we got a few. So I have a scatale. Um, my, my wife and my kids made this for me. Um, so a scatale was um, kind of considered one of the first uh, military cipher devices. It was used by the uh, Spartan Greeks uh, around uh, 475 BCE. It's a good example of a substitution or a transposition cipher. Thank you. So um, who wants to volunteer to solve the scatale? Yeah, all right. So, um, so what the scatale was, um, and, it, and it relied a lot on um, uh, people not knowing how to read. That was kind of important, um, <laughs> which at the time was not a problem. Um, but uh, uh, so you would have a messenger who would have a very secret message that uh, uh, he or she would carry uh, uh, to correspond some kind of military orders or, or, or information. And um, the recipient uh, would have a very specific uh, pole or piece of wood that they would wrap the message around. And as they wrap the message around, uh, the message would become clear. So if you were to look at this now, it's just a jumble of letters, right? But as you wrap it around the, the pole, uh, and the Greeks, you know, they were very specific about the size of the, the pole, right? So it, if you had the wrong size pole, it wouldn't, wouldn't work, right? So, so I have a message here, and our volunteer, what's your name? Chris. Chris, all right, I, I, I provided which is some, some tape there, Chris, because you might need it to tape down the side. But go ahead and start working on that, and, um, and there's a prize in it for you if, it, uh, if and when you, fix, uh, you, you figure out what the message is. So, so we'll come back to you. <coughs> but that's essentially, the, the graphic isn't the best, and I apologize about that, but um, that is essentially what, what Chris is working on there for us. And we'll see if, if uh, timing-wise, he's able to get there. Um, <laughs> uh, it's pretty long. So. Uh, and, um, and, and then back, uh, right into the Caesar cipher. So we'll check back with you. So uh, how many of you guys know what the Caesar cipher is? All right. So, so we're going to go through this pretty quick. Um, so um, you know, was, uh, uh, this was used in ancient Rome. There's, there's documented uh, 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 information on Caesar sending messages to um, I think it was Potomus or somebody in, in Germany, uh, you know, uh, conveying military orders using uh, this kind of uh, uh, in encryption method. Uh, it's also called a, a rot cipher, so a rotation cipher, and it's a, a classic example of a substitution cipher. <coughs> um, so, and I, I apologize in advance, the, the letters, the, um, this is kind of a new, if anybody's seen a, a, a presentation I've done in the past. This is kind of a new thing for me, having text and, and, uh, and st you know, this style to it. So um, the, the text doesn't exactly line up the way I wanted, but, but this is an example. So you have, um, uh, you know, an example of some, some cipher text here. You know it's a, uh, a, a substitution Caesar cipher. Uh, you also know that it is um, a classic uh, substitution cipher that uh, is commonly called a ROT13. Right, so, so we have a ROT13 table at the top there. Um, you know, A equals N, B equals, you know, O, C equals P, et cetera, et cetera. So um, how you go through, uh, you take your cipher text, and you find the P, and you know that that equals C, right? And you find a, the N, and that equals A and so on. So uh, Z, N, Q, D, L, Y. Anybody have any questions about that? I, 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 yeah. That's a good question, right? So I'm going to speed it up a little bit, but if there's no questions. So, so everybody's seen, you know, ROT13 was commonly used in the, uh, the old BBS days to, to hide you know, what, what we were saying, but it was, a, it was an easy way to, to decrypt that message, right? And it's, um, I don't know if it's still used today. It's kind of, ROT26, who's a big fan of that one? Yes, all right. <laughs> every time, every time. So, so we speed it up, and 
then we have our super secret message. All right. <clears throat> so, um, so that was, you know, uh, 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 Caesar. Um, let's talk about crypto analysis on that. Uh, so, you know, while we were all mucking about in the mud in, in Western Europe, uh, you know, arguing over the inherent rights of uh, tarts wielding swords to, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and knights who say knee. Um, uh, back, back in, in uh, uh, the Arabic uh, um, civilization, they were actually working on things like math and, 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 and language. And, and so, so there was a, there was a, a gentleman called Al-Kindi who wrote um, a, a, a book or a, a manifesto, essentially, that uh, was called Decrypting Encrypted Correspondence. And this was around 850 uh, CE. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and that's the first page of it there, an example of it. Uh, but it, it basically went through how to do frequency analysis, which if you, if you know, know what that is, um, that the Caesar cipher is uh, very susceptible to frequency analysis. Um, I'll jump back to it really quick. Um, so you can see, and this, this message may not be the best one, but you can see certain letters reoccurring over and over again. And if the keys are know the language that it's in, potentially know who sent, knew who sent the message, knew who res was the recipient of the message, then you could somehow derive you know, the, the, the message from that. Like A's occur commonly, E is the most commonly occurring letter in the English language. So, so if you you know, get a, a, a ROT13 message, chances are if there's a lot of letters in there um, that are the same, it's E. So, um, also uh, um, in the uh, uh, 1400s, there was a, a 14 volume encyclopedia written by another gentleman whose name I will not uh, uh, slaughter there, um, uh, called the Shib al Asha, and it had a whole volume uh, dedicated to crypto analysis. The only real documented case of, of uh, uh, crypto analysis in the, uh, 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 you know, the Middle Ages in Europe were uh, monks cloistered up. They, uh, they were, you know, kind of focused on intellectual ideas, but they were looking in the Bible for things um, that, that uh, they could extrapolate and codes and things like that. So, so we, we weren't completely lost, just mostly. <clears throat> um, uh, it's worth noting there too that um, around this time um, Mary Queen of Scots happened so just a little bit of trivia there uh, if anybody knows uh, who she was and what happened to her uh, basically a big crypto fail that ended in her head getting lopped off so um, <clears throat> so secrets are important right uh, so, so moving on to the uh, Vignet cipher and I'm not French so if I'm mispronouncing that apologies um, but uh, it's essentially, and this is a this is a simplified version of a of a tabula recta or a, a, a vignette square. Um, it's called a couple of different things, um, but it, it's a series of different Caesar ciphers. Essentially, um, what's really unique about this is it introduced the use of a code word. Um, the, the code word is interesting because we see it's the concept of a shared secret reoccurring even in today's cryptography, right? Um, it, it's a great example of a polyalphabetic substitution cipher. <clears throat> so before I get into that, how's, how's the Scitale going? Awesome, awesome, cool. I think you're going to make it. Um, so we have this bit of ciphertext. And uh, since we're the, re the, the uh, recipient of the message, uh, we did not intercept this. We know, um, you know who it's from, what the method of encryption is. We also know the shared secret, the keyword, right? The code word. It's chocolate, right? So, <laughs> is it your safe word too? Awesome. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> um, so so how, how, we, how we would decrypt this message, we take our ciphertext and we repeat the code word over and over again and match it up. Um, and again, apologies that the, the letters don't match up perfectly there. <clears throat> but we take, uh, we take our tabula recta, our, uh, our 
Vignette Square. And uh, we select the first letter of our code word, C. And we go over to the first letter of our ciphertext, which is Y. And then we go up, and that is our message letter, or clear text, W. We do the same with H to O, up to H. Again, so see how that happens there? Okay. O, uh, O to S is E, C to T, R, O to S, E. Any questions, concerns on how that happens? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep, yep. So it just repeats for every letter. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I don't know if it's if it's apparent there, but yeah. So and there there are a couple of different ways to do this. Uh, I've seen I you know for for ease of of presentation, I kept the the letters in the same place as the words of the of the encrypted message. Um, sometimes people will break it up, um, you know, groups of five, 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 um, uh, and then you have to kind of stitch it all together once you have the, the decrypted message. But so I'll, I'll jump through this really quick here. This is a really easy one to encrypt and decrypt, um, and and is really pretty pretty secret if you don't know the keyword uh, because the alphabet keeps changing. So so. Where is fancy bread? <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it, it was a tough one, and it and it kept people uh, thinking uh, for a long time on how to break it, um, and and how to use it and use it well easily, um, especially in the field, um, uh, sometimes called field cryptography, right? Um, <clears throat> some people that were really really taken with this uh, this. Uh, this method um, and crypto analyzing this method. Uh, everybody know who that is on the left? This is Charles Babbage, uh, uh, bon vivant, if you will. Um, so, so he's just a guy that liked to do really cool things, right? Um, and at one point, he was challenged to decrypt Vignette. Uh, a lot of people thought it was indecipherable, um, and he actually figured out how to do it. Uh, his findings, um, uh, he did that back in 1854, um, but his and never actually published his findings. His uh, findings weren't published until the 1970s. Um, there were a couple other people that, that successfully were able to show crypto analysis of Vignette after that, um, but at the time, he was one of the first people. Interesting fact about Babbage, uh, everybody know what uh, um, the difference engine is? So, so potentially the first computer, if he could have built it, he designed that. He also hung out with Ida Lovelace, really cool lady. So. So uh, considered one of the first programmers. <clears throat> um, the guy in the middle, anybody know who that is? Uh, close. Uh, uh, his pen name, Lewis Carroll. Uh, Charles Ludwig Dodgson. So uh, Lewis Carroll, um, he actually uh, said that the Vignette cipher was unbreakable in 1868. So even though it had already been broken. Um, but he was a really big mathematician. Um, you can find a lot of secrets and codes in his work. Um, last guy, everybody knows who that is, right? Poe, right. Um, so um, uh, he, he did not directly um, talk about Vignet, but what's really cool about him in, in popular culture was uh, in the, um, uh, at, uh, 1843, he wrote The Gold Bug, which uh, is one of those stories you read in, in, I've read in middle school and was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, but it actually goes through step by step how to decipher an encrypted message. And it just kind of piqued my interest as a kid. Uh, I you know, really, really liked Poe. Uh, he, uh, interestingly, also put out a challenge in um, uh, a periodical called the Philadelphia's Alexander Weekly Messenger, um, claiming that he could decrypt any monoalphabetic substitution cipher. And he successfully deciphered all of the hundreds of submissions that were sent in. So, so uh, big into codes. And, and uh, definitely, if you have not read The Gold Bug since middle school or high school, I recommend it. So, fun stuff. How we doing? You got it. What do you got?
Very good, sir. All right. So, your prize. I know you already have applied cryptography. We talked about that. But uh, you can select a book. I have a copy of uh, Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. Awesome. All right. There you go. Thank you. Appreciate it. And if anybody else wants to check out the Scatale, it'll be up here, and I'll, I'll probably be at the, the CompuNet Tenable table after. So, um, so I have a couple more books um, and, and crypto challenges. So, so whoever solves those other crypto challenges first, uh, you get your choice of a couple other books. I'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, so some early cipher machines. Um, most of these machines uh, on the left there, um, the Albertini cipher machine. Um, a lot of these were really just ways to try and streamline using Vignet or Caesar, for that matter, uh, variants on the Caesar cipher in, in the field, right? Uh, for military use, uh, things like that. Um, most of these were uh, substitution ciphers. Uh, the Wheatstone, the second one there, used, um, instead of letters, it used symbols. Um, the Jeffersonian sim uh, cylinder, this is commonly attributed to uh, uh, Jefferson, uh, um, but it's never been proved that he actually used one. I have a toy version of it here. Uh, if anybody wants to try and take a look at it, I have a secret message. But basically, you would line up. It's a series of um, uh, wheels. And in, a, in, a, in an official grade one, you can move the wheels around so you can really be sneaky with your message. But you essentially have your, your, your message, your clear text, and you line it up, and then you pick another, another line and you know it's completely encrypted. Z X N H C U I C Z E. Uh, is that a C? Yeah, C N. Right. And then you'd look through here and see that there is a secret message. So if anybody wa wants to check this out, uh, you can come up and look at it. Or um, after the last one, that's a picture from the uh, the crypto museum at the NSA. Um, that is a Confederate cipher disk. Um, uh, from uh, the Civil War. Uh, so, so one interesting tidbit about that is, you know, again, they had a, uh, uh, it was a variation on Vignet, they had uh, code words, and they used primarily the same three code words or phrases throughout the whole war. Uh, so once, once the Allies had figured those out and had access to their device, um, or not the Allies, excuse me, the, the, uh, the, the, the Northern folks, the Yanks, um, they, uh, they uh, uh, were able to, to decrypt it. The Yanks w version of that had uh, um, uh, letters and numbers on it, uh, a series of zeros and eights. So. Another fun one is the uh, Mexican Army cipher disk. This was, uh, this was considered uh, state of the art. I have one here. This is a toy version of it, essentially. Um, but it was used during the border war uh, with the US uh, early 1900s. Uh, it's a monoalphabetic uh, cipher, but essentially how you'd use it is um, the, the, the sender of the message, the receiver of the message, would have an agreed upon uh, setting uh, where you would have um, you know, the letter A equals, it's a series of numbers around each, each wheel, right? So the letter A, you would have a, a shared secret of you know, A52960. And um, then you would send a series of uh, encoded messages, and using that, you could decrypt it. Um, if you continue to use the same setting over and over again, people get you know, wind of it, they understand it, um, they get the device, very easy to intercept and decrypt the messages. Um, what's interesting is I've seen, um, this guy did a video where he uses a, uh, on YouTube, uh, so I saw it on the internet, so you know it works. Um, uh, um, but he, he actually makes it so that uh, this is still a fairly decent encryption device, which is interesting. Uh, by changing the, the uh, rotation of the wheels uh, with each letter you're decrypting, uh, it really makes it pretty, in, pretty tough to, to, to crack. So, so um, another one that's, that's really common um, uh, that uh, kind of came out of the cracking of Vignet was um, uh, a one-time pad, which uh, is basically considered an uncrackable piece of, uh, uh, of encryption. So, <clears throat> very good. Any questions about that?
Awesome. So, the big one, Enigma, right? Everybody knows Enigma. Um, or uh, everybody knows Enigma? Yes? Okay, good. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of nods. Good, good, good. All right. So, um, you know, all these things we had done at Hacker Camp, right? Um, um, codes, you know, 100, 200. This was the 500, right? This was the big dog. Um, uh, so, uh, encryption was a, a rotor based cryptographic device. Um, uh, so, you had different rotors that would move uh, and the text would change as you, uh, you know, encipher and decipher a message, right? Uh, some of the first rotor machines uh, started showing up around 1915. Um, a couple of Dutch naval officers developed it. Uh, <clears throat> they, they, I believe there were only two rotors in that one. Uh, the, it was uh, then modified with a keyboard and a light system uh, to input the text and, uh, uh, you know, spit out the, the, the decrypted message. Um, the actual enigma that was used uh, by the Nazis in World War II uh, was developed around 1918 by um, Arthur Schriebius. Um, that actually had three interchangeable rotors. So you, not only would the rotors move, but you had different rotors with letters in different locations on them. So, so pretty, pretty amazing. Um, they had a plug board. To, to change how the, 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 the text was reflected. And that'll make a little bit more sense in, in, in a few minutes if, if you're not familiar with the inner workings of the, the Enigma. But um, some interesting statistics. Uh, the, the increased, as you increase the, uh, the rotors, it increases the, the, the ability to decrypt the message exponentially, right? Um, so uh, big numbers. Uh, <laughs> um, so as, as you have, you know, with, with three wheels, six pairs of letters that are swapped, um, that increases the possible settings of keys to 159 million, 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 right? Um, and, uh, you know, if you had a, a thousand cryptographers each with captured Enigma machines uh, and they'd ha tested four keys per minute all day, every day, it would take 1.8 billion years to try every combination. So that kind of gives you an idea, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, w when I was researching Hacker Camp, I found this really cool thing called the paper enigma. So, so this is really a very simple offline representation of what enigma does. Um, it's developed by a guy, Michael Koss. He works for Google now. Um, and uh, there's a link there to um, a Google code page that he has with a, a, a I think it's JavaScript or uh, a working version of the pa paper enigma on his website. <clears throat> but essentially, uh, you have there on the, the right side of the page your, your cylinders. I guess I could hold up. I've got them here too. <clears throat> but you take your handy dandy scissors and you cut along the dotted line, just like in uh, uh, kindergarten, right? Um, and uh, you have rotor one, two, and three. And uh, the rotors are then placed into over the, the uh, input, output, and reflector. And you notice the, the, the arrows on the right side of the, the rotor placement. That indicates that the rotor moves uh, as you were to type in the letter, right? So, so uh, rotor three moves every time you input a letter. And it basically goes across, reflects back, and then uh, gives you your plain text letter. And, and I have ob obtained secret uh, 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 footage of how to use this device. And we'll see if this works. So, so um, let's, let's, let's see if it works. All right, so first thing you want to do, clean up your workspace. You don't want anything else distracting you. This is sped up a little bit. This decryption took about 10 minutes. So uh, you see the rotor move. I can't actually see it going, so that's kind of tough. Um, but you see, um, I moved the rotor, and or not me, some secret person somewhere. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, so we have our first letter. Um, so worth noting, uh, the, the placement of the rotors uh, is that shared secret keyword at the bottom, EFF. And uh, so uh, each letter is run through the process 
uh, the, the crypto message and then uh, given the plain text letter. Um, so again, the machine would have done this for you, but by doing the paper enigma, the, the goal, the hope, the idea is that you understand a little bit more intimately how the device itself worked. It's not just a black box anymore. It's not an enigma anymore. It's, it's obtainable, it's understandable. Um, uh, and so it speeds up here in a second. Um, and what, what you want to look for is when rotor two moves. So right now, rotor one is the only one moving. And we've got the first kind of start of the, of the, the, uh, the, the message there. And it's, uh, it's about mm, 12 letters in, something like that, when uh, rotor two moves. But that, uh, as, as a message would become longer or more complex, you would see that rotor two would move. Uh, every so often, and then ultimately rotor one, the one all the way on the left would move. So, so really increasing the, the difficulty of decrypting the message. <clears throat> um, so there's these, uh, there's kind of hard to see there, but there's arrows to the right of the rotor. So as, as rotor one moves up, there's a, uh, there's a little arrow at the top um, so that it signifies every time that rotor moves. But then there's a, a black uh, arrow on there uh, on, yeah, yeah, uh, you can come up and grab a sheet if you want. But yeah, so it, uh, you can see here the, the, the arrow. Yeah, absolutely. And there's instructions on the bottom. I have a ton of these because this is, you know, part of the, the challenge, right, is going through a uh, paper enigma. So, um, <coughs> so, uh, Feel free to come up and grab these. I also have the vignette squares here as well. So, <clears throat> any questions around that? So, if it's fun. Um, yes, sir. So, I'm going to talk about crypto analyzing it in a second. But, but, I mean. Absolutely. So that, that's what I just showed was a decrypt of, a, of an encrypted message there. And, and I can go through it. Uh, you know. Yes, yeah, yeah, same setting and everything, yeah. So, so that shared secret is, is, is key there, right? Um, so, so cracking Enigma, right? So this is, this is a very popularized story. It's, it's uh, a key part of Cryptonomicon, uh, um, the book. Um, but also, um, you know, uh, what the difference? Uh, dif what's the name of the movie? Difference Engine? Yeah. Or the, no, the Imitation Game, right? So uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, you know, talking about Alan Turing and and his time at, at um, Bletchley Park. But uh, so so, how did they crack this in World War II? Right? Uh, how did this happen? Um, so so, uh, it started. Um, in Poland, they intercepted one of the devices in about uh, 1928. Um, so uh, uh, the, 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 and the, the, the Poles mapped the shit out of it, right? Uh, they started doing the work, um, breaking the three rotor enigma from 1932 to 1939. So uh, intercepting messages and being able to actively break those messages through math. Um, that changed. Um, as the Nazis added more rotors to, to uh, the Enigma, um, they kind of became overwhelmed. Um, so they hand, the, you know, as the war went on, um, actually kind of started, right, in uh, 1939, um, they handed over all their findings to the French and ultimately the English. Um, and that's where um, uh, Bletchley Park happened, where, um, you know, they had, uh, I believe it was 140 uh, uh, of uh, the uh, bombs is what they were called. So these are essentially uh, enigmas built on enigmas built on enigmas and an automated way of trying to crack the code within a time frame before uh, the Nazis moved to a new shared secret. Um, uh, when uh, about 1942, the Germans added another rotor to uh, the U-boats enigmas uh, because that was a really, really secretive part of the... Uh, the operation uh, and and the, the what's a little less commonly known is the U.S. got involved uh, in decrypting these messages as well. Uh, the U.S. Navy uh, worked with the National Cash Register Company. They built 121 
uh, U.S.-made bombs that were used from September 1943 to March of 1945, actively decrypting uh, 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 U-boat messages and also messages for the Luftwaffe and uh, uh, the land forces. So pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, again, what, what I guess really excites me about this is these, these were early computers. Uh, and, and the use of these led directly to, you know, this, in my mind, right? So, <clears throat> um, these are just some uh, resources and, and credits that I have to give out. I, you know, obviously I said I'm not, not, not the smartest guy, um, but, uh, uh, you know, what inspired me for this? Uh, Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon, a really cool piece of, of fiction if you haven't read it. I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, it, it, it has real people like Alan Turing, and he inserts fictional characters that interact with them uh, to help uh, at Bletchley Park, and then also a, uh, a more modern-day setting that still really holds true, even though the book's, what, probably 10, 15 years old now. So, so great, great novel. Uh, highly recommend it. Uh, the Code Book uh, by Simon Sting, I think is how you say his name, um, but that's right here. Amazing book. Uh, if you're interested in the history of cryptography, solve the puzzle. You may have the chance to pick this. Um, the other one, just because I, I, I think that this applies directly to us, the very sought after second edition of Bruce Schneier's Applied Cryptography. So uh, uh, solve these challenges. One's a vignette, one's an enigma. I'm not going to tell you which is which, but if you've been paying attention at all, it should be apparent. I have paper enigmas here. I have vignette squares here. Uh, if you can solve the text, if you're one of the first two people now to solve the text, you get to choose one of those books. <clears throat> uh, you know, I've got a couple other shout outs there. Um, you know, the National Cryptology Museum at um, the NSA headquarters. Um, uh, I can't even read it anymore, but there's a Flickr feed I used, some of, uh, that were, uh, some of the photos I used. Um, Dr. Wayne Summers um, had a, a really good uh, 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 presentation on Cypher Machines, and then a bunch of links. And I've got those on, on my website, www.nibble.tech. So um, if you want to, uh, one I'd really highly recommend if you're interested in crypto analysis and, and crypto analysis uh, uh, exercises is the Black Chamber. That's on there. Um, that's the guy who wrote the code book, one of the giveaways. Um, that's uh, his website. Really, really cool uh, 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 exercises in paper cryptography. So, any questions, concerns, tomatoes? Great. Thank you.